That's okay. Oh, look at this. We're live, baby. Let's start sharing. Oh, bring your bring your camera down just a little bit. Got it. How's that? Uh, it's going I just want to see if I can get the whole logo in. Okay. Is that good? That's a little better. Yeah. That'll do it. Rocky Romanella is the founder and CEO of 360 Management Services, LLC, and author of the book, Titan Alumni. With over 40 years of boots on the ground leadership experience, Rocky creates excitement through his energy, passion, and knowledge in every podcast. During his 36 years at UPS, he led one of the largest rebranding initiatives in franchising history, the UPS Store, revolutionizing the $9 billion retail shipping and business services market. He also led the integration of more than 20 acquisitions that became UPS Supply Chain Solutions and led its improved financial performance, capabilities, and global footprint. Post UPS, he served as CEO and director for Unitech Global Services, a telecommunications company, and serves as an independent board member and advisor. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. Do this look like work to you? Nah. Looking at the lights like it's all that is for me. Everyone tonight is here. All that is for me. Hands in the air. Yeah, all that is for me. Bottles over here. All that is for me. Bottles bring me bottles down. Hello, 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 and welcome in to the May 18th edition of the Rome Show. I am Andrew Romanella. I am your host, and I am back this week from my hiatus. I am alongside my partner, Mr. Rocky Romanella. Hey. Welcome back. Welcome back in a different location again. So this is the third straight week where there's been a different location for the Romo Sapiens. We are at what we call the Beach House. We have the cool accoutrements. We have the logo in the background. Fantastic. And we come to you from Facebook.com slash Andrew.Romanella, as well as HamiltonRadio.net channel two. Remember, you can call into the show the entire evening, 609-807-2492, or you can get us on the social medias at CoachRomo24. We got some polls and some questions out there if you want to write into the show, or, of course, on the Facebook in the comments section. I'll tell you what, Rock. We got a jam-packed show, I would say, for the Romo Sapiens this evening. And it's so jam-packed that we've decided to throw an extra digit in the phone number on the screen. So if you're paying attention on Facebook, there's an extra four. <laughs> it's 807-2492. Rube, you got an extra four on the screen. We got the so up. fired up. We so fired up. There's so much to there. talk about. I mean, there's so many. Like, you've got your grade A sports back. Yes. And that's because different sports, not your four major professional sports, came back and proved you could handle playing without spectators. Listen, Bundesliga is back. NASCAR in back. Golf in. It's all on the docket for you tonight, but we don't start there. No. We start with straight off the Rome. Straight off the Rome, okay? And tonight, this date in history that's coming off the Rome is in Major League Baseball. It is this. MLS. On, <laughs> MLB. Just kidding. On May 18th, 2004, Randy Johnson became the oldest pitcher in Major League Baseball history to throw a perfect game. As a Mets fan, I love it because his Arizona Diamondbacks beat the Atlanta Braves and Chipper Jones in a 2-1 to victory. That was the 17th perfect game thrown in Major League Baseball history. That was May 18th, 2004. Four, and Randy Johnson became the oldest player in history. I believe that was his, like, fourth perfect game or something crazy like that. Randy Johnson. Probably no hitter, not a perfect game. Maybe. Yeah. Hall of Famer. But that is your straight off the Rome today, May 18, 2004. And I'll tell you what, Rock. And I was thinking about this before the show, but now that I said that out loud, this really makes me miss baseball. No, I know. But And, and by the way, Randy Johnson – Greatest nickname ever, the Big U. The Big U, yeah, so good. Great, by the way, one of the classic mullets that of will, all time. <laughs> just always look good. 
And not to mention the perfect game at the age 40 also took out a bird in the middle of the All-Star game that one time. Yeah. Yeah. People, PETA called him on that, actually. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he took out a bird. I mean, I get it. <laughs> Insane. But no, that's a that's a great side. I just love that he's forty when he throws the perfect game. Yeah, you know, I think that's cool. I mean, he's think about imagine like a six foot seven dude. Imagine a six foot seven dude like hitting you a hundred mile an hour fastball and you're trying to hit it. Yeah, that's not. He was a Raldis Chapman before Raldis Chapman. He, like I say about Michael Jordan, and you know we'll talk about the last dance coming up later on in the show. Exciting. Like like I say about Michael Jordan, he changed pitching position in Major League Baseball. He threw harder than everyone else. It's like, who, who could be, like, and he came up through the Mariners. Yeah, he's a Mariners. He's, he's with the A-Rod. So he threw, he Edgar changed Martinez. the game. Yeah, he started in Seattle. And, like, it's like, who who are the teams that we have right now that are like those Mariners teams? Like, who who are we looking at right now? Like, if we had Major League Baseball today, who would we we'd be looking at? Think about it. Think about it. Because you have, well, you want to talk baseball, talk baseball. Right, because you had, you had, <laughs> you had the big unit. Yeah. You had Alex Rodriguez, but then you think about like the Vlad Guerrero Expo team. Just the Astros. You think about like it's the Pedro the Martinez. The Astros, the Yankees, it's the Dodgers. But I feel like I don't know. I, I don't know if the players like. Yeah. Until this Astros scandal, you had three of the best pitchers in Major League Baseball, or three of the top ten pitchers in Major League Baseball. You had three of the top ten position players in Major League Baseball. I when you look like at the Yankees, you have if Garrett, if you include Garrett Cole on the roster now, what people believe, or or you now Severino might be hurt, who the hell knows, but believe he's a top ten pitcher in Major League Baseball and healthy. Now you have two of them on your rotation, plus you have Aaron Judge, okay, you have Gary Sanchez, and you have Glaber Torres, like three people who believe are studs, along with John Carlos Stanton. I guess I guess the my Dodgers, Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, shall I continue. Justin Turner. Shall I continue? Justin Cody Turner Bellinger. started with the Mets, though. Cody Bellinger. Yeah, but Justin Turner started with the Mets. That's, That's my true. point. My point is, is who's our who's our non-market team the race. generating the best talent the right race. now? Always the race. Always. The Tampa Bay Devil Race. No, the race. The Tampa Bay Devil Race. Always. It's they always generate the players most. stadium and the Tampa Bay Devil Race. They so they're they're the they're the non like Yes. Like not they're, not they're, the non- they're a small market. They're a small market organization producing the best players. Kansas City Royals when they won the World Series. Kansas City. Side. That's a great example. When I s- thought about baseball, I thought about a text message you sent me the other day. Oh, Bryce Harper. Yes. Nice. Where Bryce Harper proposed a potential comeback of Major League Baseball, 135 game season. It would start in July and run through May 15th. Then the postseason would last two weeks, take a college World Series-esque round-robin play until the World Series matchup, which would then be a seven-game World Series. I like the concept. I think I'd make some changes. Yeah, I probably wouldn't play 135. No, I'd play 100 games. I was no, Because there's no chance I'd want to play into November. Because for the same reason I've been saying about hockey, like what should be canceling to keep the integrity of 20, 2021, Right, I think that you don't want to play into November, December because you don't want to push back next season. And Major League Baseball last year just made a decision to push up their season to change the fact that the World Series is no longer in October. So now it is in October. So then if you were to make the World Series end on, let's say, November 31st, I get it. It's a different year. But if you're still trying to stick to that principle of it being October baseball, what I think, you take Bryce Harper's model, you cut off, 40 games, maybe make it a 90 to 100 game season, end it on October 15th, and then if you do need to play some World Series games in the first week of November, you can handle that. That's been the last 20 years, but I don't think you need to be playing to November 31st, and I don't think you need to be putting 135 games in July, August, September, October, and half of November. I don't know. I see, you know, he did what? say six man rotation. No, I love that. He did say that. Love the six man rotation. Maybe mandatory. I've been a proponent of the six man rotation now for two, two, three years. True Mets. I'm spoken like a true Mets. I'm fan. sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of watching pitch counts, but that's a completely other discussion. Um, the only thing I'm okay with in November and December is you're not going to play in New York. You're not right. going to play in New Jersey. You're not going to play anywhere. You're in, playing what? You're California. Not, you're not going to play in Cleveland. Vegas. No, you're going to play in either Texas. a dome. You're going to play in a dome or you're going to play in Vegas. 
Well, you're going to Vegas, you're going to Arizona, Arizona, Arizona. Texas. Either way, you're you're going to play in warm weather. Right. You're not going to have to worry about snow. So so it's not it's not that outlandish. It's just whether or not it's going to get into spring right. training and into April of next year. So let's play the hypothetical game. Okay. Okay. You be the Major League Baseball commissioner. You take a realistic stance on Bryce Harper's proposal, and you give back your proposal. Start, oh, here's what I want. Here, simple guidelines. Start date, amount of games, how you construct the playoffs, where you'd play. Four, four categories. So I'm going to take I like the July. And before he says that, 609-807-2492. If you have a proposal for Major League Baseball or write it into the Facebook. Go ahead. Don't touch me. I have to sanitize my elbow. <laughs> oh, you give me the hand sanitizer. Where's our producer? We need hand sanitizer. Anyways, <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm just looking at so I'm gonna take the July 31st start date. I like that. Okay. I'm gonna pull back to a hundred games. I like the World Series format for the playoffs. So you expand the playoffs to get more teams in. You play. So it's a round robin tournament. I love that. elimination. Love that. And I would figure out a way if I was playing. I'm okay playing in November only if the World Series yeah. plays I'm gonna in the ten days to, in the ten days leading up to or backing into Thanksgiving. So you want the World Series played near Thanksgiving? If yeah, I'm I'm actually I, I was thinking about it as you were talking about it, and then as I kind of talked through why, that, um, because I think that it's really important that you capture as many, you capture as much viewership as possible. Like, cool. Governor Cuomo today is like, yeah, we want sports to come back. Okay, that's great, but like, how much TV revenue is are the TVs generating? Right, so if I'm MLB, I need to figure out a way to literally capture my audience when the playoffs happen, right? And I've got people who are backing into like a, a guaranteed four to five day weekend, like where I could be playing my World Series every day. Like it's not a bad. It's but here's the argument: you're going up against football, which Thanksgiving is a gigantic football week and weekend. You are going to go up against football, but you're. But do you, you want to take that risk? Do you not play on Thanksgiving Day? The base, the baseball, the baseball playoffs and the World Series go up against football every year. They do, but they go up against a different part of football season. You're going up against September, which everyone hates in the National Football League. No. And then now, and this was baseball's whole point, pull the World Series closer to October. You'll take ratings over week five and week six of football, maybe. Listen, when you when play you get the back half of the season. Yeah, well, when you play 162, you shouldn't touch November. I agree with that. But it's, it's, a, it's a freak year. But, I, but what I'm saying is, so you want to play 100 games over the course of that same amount of season, which means that there's going to be off days scattered across America. Take an off day here. Take an off day there. Why? If you're going to do 100 because games. Because you, you have to have off days because you're only going to be playing in 10 stadiums. You're not playing in every stadium. It's true. And you're going to have to you're, go through You have procedures. to limit travel. You're playing in, in 10 stadiums. You're not playing in a lot. So unless you play two yeah, games right. in one stadium every day, you need the time. And you're and you're probably gonna have to li- you're gonna have to limit the amount of people that are there. That and are by the way, staff. you don't think that the players' association is gonna say, "Hey, I'm taking a pay cut because we are not generating the revenue. I still want my off days." True, that's a good point. You're 100. That you're 100 right. And here's my other thought process: if you have training staff, right, and you have general managers, and you have you know higher ups that need to be in their organization, at what point do you limit? that amount of people is it because they can sit up there and not everyone's in the dugout that you can space it out or are you gonna is it gonna be a point where maybe the bullpen is actually in the stands because i saw that in the bundesliga the guys that were on the bench were sitting in the empty stands two or three seats separated in between both of them i i don't i think it's gonna be where if you're with the team you're with the team that's all you got because you're going to get tested, correct? Right, and and that's I mean that's the complaint of the, a lot of the players is that hey, if we come back, right? I don't get to go home ever. Right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Right. So I think they're they're going to hold the same rules true to any of the supporting staff. But that's why I believe that you should have, I believe you should have a. That's why I believe you should have less games. To your point. Less game. And have more time to spread those games out to make sure that it's organized. So then you're good. Yeah. So we're going into November. I just don't want to go to Thanksgiving. I'll I go. Love, I'll I go love to Thanksgiving. I'll go to November fifteenth. 
Could you imagine baseball on Thanksgiving? Well, why not start July 15th, go to November 15th? Well, there's only one game. It's the World Series. No one watches the 8 o'clock Thanksgiving game anyway. Dude, that's I'm, the worst game. They should never – it should be 1 o'clock and 4 o'clock. Let's get it done. Let's go watch some baseball. In a time when you're thinking about capitalizing the people at home scenario, you're, you're not going to take away from one of the biggest football days of the year. Yeah, biggest football days of the year. But, like, you know, there's – It's like – that's But that viewers – think about Hey, maybe about. that's your travel day. As a World Series travel day. But that's what I'm saying. I think if you were to take that model, you got to make Thanksgiving an off day. It has to be. Fine, but as long as you're playing that week, you want to so capture late. the audience. I know, I know. I think you're. I think they're captured on November 15th. Yeah, but now if you go into Thanksgiving week, you can take your uh, your league championship series and make them seven rounds in seven games. You play your round robin. Now you get so a national, saying, now you get an NLCS and an ALCS of seven games. Do you take the World Series format, College World Series format, out of the picture with your new format? No, I take the College World Series format, keep it in league, so you can play NLCS, ALCS, and a World Series. So I want ten in each league, playing round robin. Then, so of the 30 some 31 teams, 20 make, teams, 20 teams make the playoffs. 20 teams make the playoffs. You go 10 and 10, round robin, two locations, double elimination, double elimination, and then you get your four teams remaining. They play two seven game series and a third seven game series for the World Series. Those three series happen in November. Everything else is done by October. Why? Let's rock and roll. Why? Why are you adding teams as opposed to? Because you only played 100 <laughs> games, and it's the only way, let's say you're allowed to watch, like, it's the only way you can help generate the interest for each of the teams to collect on some sort of TV money that they're losing out by not having people in the stands. Okay, you're right. Okay, so now, while we're on this topic then, I want to talk about the Bundesliga, and I want to talk about the NASCAR, because if we're talking about Major League Baseball and the NFL playing seasons, we're talking about them going about the same guidelines that we've seen the KBL go over, the Bundesliga go over, NASCAR go over, even the golf, no spectators at golf, right? Is that going to be, like, are you looking at the way soccer did it and you're saying that's pretty much going to be how every sport that has multiple players on the field, multiple people on the sidelines, a max size roster is going to have to handle it. Because yeah. I can't imagine 90 people, only players, football on the sidelines. They're going to have to probably limit that roster on the sidelines. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, you're probably going to have coaches wearing top hats like Gene and Gene Hackman in the replacements without a headset because, you know, they're not going to have as many people to do all that stuff. Could you imagine? <laughs> Could you imagine? You know, quarterbacks might have to call their own plays again. Could you imagine if there was no no headsets? You might no, have to, no, no, that you might have to throw a play into that a tight end. He's going to have to run in and be like, Coach says red 23. The wide receiver. Like, you know, that's... That'd be, that'd be sweet. No, but see, the, the only game... You would game. really see how talented the, the, the football players are. Yeah, but that would never happen. It would be sick. It would be pretty sick, though. You'd be playing on the gridiron. That's essentially watching Peyton Manning. Yeah. But Bundesliga, NASCAR, they didn't skip a beat. Well, you have to... It was different. The celebrations were different. Seeing no fans was different. So what you have to understand about NASCAR is that for the participants, absolutely nothing was different. Outside of probably preparations, celebration, and outside of preparations and maybe celebration, from a pure sport execution standpoint, from the athletes, from the ninety minutes they played soccer or thirty hours they drove. No, 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 no. I'm saying, look, think about. It. I'm in a NASCAR race. Yeah, there's like no difference. There is literally no difference. You can't hear the crowd. You can no. probably can't even see the crowd. No. Maybe. Now you're driving. Right. You're driving. You've got a guy. You've got a guy in your headset telling you to look out. You got a guy on your left. You got a guy on your right. And you're racing your ass off to the finish line. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you. I mean, literally that. nothing's different. Like nothing is different from an NASCAR standpoint. Outside of, I feel bad for the people who couldn't tell you. Did you watch any of them? I did. I watched a little bit of NASCAR. I you touched. NASCAR. I touched <laughs> the Bundesliga. I wanted to see it. Yeah, I understand. I touched the Bundesliga for about 15 minutes. Okay. And I. It sucks because I only ever turn Bundesliga on because it's so loud. Yeah, it is loud. Because it's just ridiculous. But it was funny. I was talking to the kid at work today who loves, he's a big soccer guy. He's like, Yeah, I wish I could understand because you can hear them talking to right. each other on the field. It's like, when but you it's all in German. Right. Yeah. So, like, it'd be love, love to, you know, what are they saying to each other? Yeah, you have no cool. idea. Well, you, can't you put the captions on the TV? Not in German. 
you can't get them to have English? Like, no, we're just gonna caption shit talking. <laughs> yeah, but that would be hilarious. I mean, I might try it. Next time it's on, I think I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna turn it on, I'm gonna try to put the captions on. Well, I popped the golf on for a minute, popped the NASCAR on for a little bit, and I didn't watch the Bundesliga. The golf intrigued me. I'm intrigued by the golf. I like the golf idea. For those of you that didn't watch it, uh, Rory McIlroy went up against, went with Dustin Johnson up against Matt Wolf, who I, I'd never heard of, and Ricky Fowler. They played for a $3 million charity purse, which they split essentially like 65, 45 or something along those lines. Uh, McElroy and Johnson won on a closest to the pin um, competition, which I thought was a pretty cool way to settle it. Almost like a shootout in hockey is the way I looked at it. Yeah, I like that. I thought that was a good idea. Something nice. we need to think about in uh, regular season golf, no majors. <laughs> In the FedEx championships? The winners donated $1.85 million to the American Nurses Foundation, which is super awesome. That's nice. And the losers donated $1.15 million to the CDC Foundation. So that was, like I said before, a total of $3 million. I love it. It's the premise of now what's going to then happen, which is Tiger Woods and Peyton Manning are taking on um, Phil, Mc Phil Mickelson and Tom Brady. Yes. Memorial Day weekend. Exciting. I'm amped. He's taken Tiger and Peyton. I'm still undecided. Mickelson took the first when it was the first match in 2018, Tiger versus Phil. Tiger, up. Tiger has won, since won a major. Has since won a major, which I don't think matters at all in this scenario. He, yes, because he's, he's got his mojo back. I, yeah, I agree, but I think a lot of what has to do with this also is the way Tom Brady and Peyton Manning show up. I think Peyton, Peyton's going to win. Are you intrigued? I'm, of course. Yeah. I love it. Why? Because I want to see Tom Brady and Peyton Manning play golf. I want to hear them shit talk each other. I know. They've already started. They've done like. I know. Did you together. see them? It's great. I yeah. watched them. They're, they're fantastic. Well, Peyton's, Peyton's his personality is incredible. The bottom line is, people, sports are coming back, and we're super excited about it. Now, some people wrote into the show um, when I put it on Instagram, and one of the big ones is, I miss baseball. And, like, I feel that 100%. But, like, at the end of the day, the unfortunate part of the situation is because of baseball's monster schedule, it's going to be the hardest one to bring back. I think football, truthfully, in my opinion, will kick off on the normal slate in terms of being in September. I just don't think they're going to be fans in the stadium. Now, my question becomes, what do you do with season ticket holders? You know, what do you do with salary caps? What are the ramifications of leagues right now? You see, you know, I feel like NASCAR and, and Bundesliga and golfs are in a different category than when we're talking about Major League Baseball, the NFL, National Hockey League, and the NBA. See, here's my thing. Like, I actually think it's easier for, for baseball to come back. Why? Because they haven't started yet? Because you, you're, you're literally social distanced the entire game. Yeah, in theory, I, I, I agree. You're six feet away from everyone. The closest people together are the umpire and the catcher. I think it just comes down to the amount of games on the schedule and where you play those games. Yeah, I, I and think making it fair, like to your point. Well, the problem is he, he, here's the real problem you throw baseball in 10 stadiums in Southern California, Arizona, Texas, you are Florida, on baseball. <laughs> Texas and Florida, right? You can play all 162 games, no. you play, but the problem is, is you've got to put them on TV. Right. You want commentators. Right. You want all this stuff, but I'm just curious, like, why do you want all that stuff if it's not going to yield you the revenue that it would, right? Whereas you could play a full season that way and only broadcast 50% of the games. But then what's the point of playing the season? That's the, that, the point is to give the fit. The, they wouldn't play the sport just for the championship for no fans to watch. The idea of sports is for fans to watch. How much? They're not going to play games that can't be seen. So you're telling me At least in the, the local end, networks. I'm just saying, like, how many local people who already get their home broadcast are going to purchase the MLB extra innings package. But that's that goes the same whether there are fans in the stands or not. That's going to always be the same debate, but they're going to broadcast every single game. Well, you're not going to play one professional sports game. At 12 o'clock on a Tuesday? Yeah. Dude, everyone's home. 
Everyone is home. So that's my point. So if you could be playing games all day in the same stadium. Yes, but it's going to be broadcasted. You just said if they don't broadcast 50 of the games. Well, that's how they help not spend as much money without any money coming in so they can pay their players more. But the TV contracts, in my opinion, are almost going to stay exactly the same because you're if you fit 100, and, 100 games, let's say, and the postseason into four, five months, you're still fitting. You're still playing essentially a five month season in theory, regular season. Okay. okay. So the TV money, right? So be it 62 games less, it's also still less money for the owners. Owners aren't getting fans in the seats. The TV gener- revenue is still going to be there because you're what you have to watch. They, they need television. If there's no television, there's no point to play the game. Okay. Right? So, so then why not try and broadcast 162 games? Because I just think at this point in time, to back yeah, there's not enough. Time. It's just not enough. <laughs> like it's just it's too much. To, it's too much now. That's why you're playing to December. I mean, now you like now, <laughs> not like now. Now it's a stretch. Now, like now, now it's a stretch. Six zero nine eight zero seven two four nine two. If you want to get in on the show, um, I see some people writing in. Our pops wrote in, and I want to say this out loud because obviously, three sixty management services is the sponsor of the show, and. We want you to head over to the number 360managementservices.com and pick up the Titan the Lug Nuts book because we have an official purchase from the Hamilton Radio app wow. of the Titan the Lug Nuts book. So that deserves a round of applause. That's exciting. We love the Romo Sapiens tuning in and we love the Romo Sapiens supporting the cause. Okay. We're a few minutes away from a break. All right. So on the back side of the break, we have a lot to talk about. Jim Harbaugh came out and proposed a letter about NFL draft changes for guys that don't get drafted. All right. The Last Dance, episodes 9 and 10, aired last night. Fire. And I know that you are a huge fan of episode 9. I'm obsessed with the whole show, but I thought episode 9 was the best one last uh, out of the two last night. And I feel like every time we watch The Last Dance, like, some information comes out that I'm like, wow. Like, I learned so much. Okay. And then last, oh, and also, there was a proposed documentary of what could be next in the next, like, basketball documentary series. I want to ask you your opinion, but I'm not going to tell you your options, okay? I'm just going to give you the two dynasties and see which one you would rather a docuseries on, okay? okay? And the last one is we got Rock's Reviews, which it started to become my new favorite segment because the last two weeks we've done, I don't know if you did it last week. I didn't listen to the last 10 minutes of the show. Uh, I got cut out. So. It's okay. All right. So we didn't do Rock's reviews last week. So the last two, which we'll be including this week, are shows that I haven't either watched or haven't been watching. And because of the Rock's review two weeks ago, I popped on Entourage. I was like, it just sounded so good when he was talking That's about right. it. That's right. That's what I'm talking about. So listen, here's the deal. We're going to go and pay those bills. All right. And then on the backside, we're going to talk about all that stuff. Remember, this is the Rome Show. It's HamiltonRadio.net, Channel 2, Facebook.com, slash Andrew.Romanella. You can call into the show at any time, 609-807-2492, or write in on the Facebook, Rubain. We just plugged the 360 Management Services. We might as well play their commercial, too. Rocky Romanella is the founder and CEO of 360 Management Services, LLC, and author of the book, Tighten the Love Nuts. With over 40 years of boots on the ground leadership experience, are you looking Rocky to become a better leader? <laughs> passion and knowledge in every podcast. Well, during his 36 we'll years, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just keep rolling here. Initiative. Rocky uh, Romanella is the founder really? and CEO of 360 Management Services LLC and author of the book Tighten the Lug Nuts. With over 40 years of boots on the ground leadership experience, Rocky creates excitement through his energy, passion, and knowledge in every podcast. During his 36 years at UPS, he led one of the largest rebranding initiatives in franchising history, the UPS Store, revolutionizing the $9 billion retail shipping and business services market. He also led the integration of more than 20 acquisitions that became UPS Supply Chain Solutions and let us improve financial performance, capabilities, and global footprint. Post-UPS, he served as CEO and Director for Unitech Global Services, a telecommunications company, and serves as an independent board member and advisor. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy the discussion. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Welcome back into the Rome Show. May 18th, 2020. It's 732 here on the East Coast. We are on HamiltonRadio.net channel 2. I am Andrew Romanella. That is Rocky Romanella. 
you, the Romo Sapien, can call in 609-807-2492. You can get in on the Facebook.com slash Andrew.Romanella or slash the Rome Show One. All right, yeah. slash the Rome Show One, Hamilton Radio. We just yeah. got a text into the show, which I think is an awesome text as well. Nikki Jensen, which was one of the first guests we had on the Rome Show, go back on the old Rome shows on Facebook or at WhyTheWorldRome.com because Nikki had some awesome stuff to say about the mindset and, and working it. I actually, I remember listening to that interview. Great. I'd love to hear what Nikki thinks about Last Dance and Michael Jordan's mindset. Yeah, that's true. So, Nikki, if you're listening and you, want, you feel like calling in and talking a little Michael Jordan mindset, feel free. 609-807-2492. It's fixed on the screen. So we're locked and loaded. So here's the deal, okay? On um, day seven, all right, so some 11 days ago, a one Jim Harbaugh, the head football coach of University of Michigan football, wrote as what they call an open letter to the college football community. The letter was centered around the National Football League draft, okay, and the idea that if a guy gets undrafted, okay, he can go back to college as opposed to having to sign a free agent contract or if maybe in some cases they don't sign a free agent contract, they go undrafted and now they can't go back to school because they've lost their eligibility. There's a lot of stuff. It's a two-page letter. I'm not going to read you the whole letter, okay? If I handle my job after the show appropriately, I will retweet it at Wide World of Rome, and you can go check it out there um, as well, all right? A few things stood out to me, okay? First off, the proposal essentially is this, okay? And this, I want your opinion on this before we go deeper. Jim Harbaugh wants the National Football League and NCAA to operate like Major League Baseball and the National Hockey League, which is which, Okay. Both in the National Hockey League and Major League Baseball, you can essentially get drafted at any point in time. In Major League Baseball, you can get drafted out of high school. If you go to junior college, you can get drafted out of your first year there or your second year there. If you go to the NCAA level, you can get drafted after your 21 or, which is more likely, your junior and or senior year of college. So essentially, you can get drafted in a year. You also can choose to turn down that draft pick status and return to college. In the National Hockey League, you can get drafted. The team can hold your rights. You can go to college. You can freaking graduate college. You can still go to NF NHL, excuse me, rookie camps during the summertime. They still have your rights. You're still a college athlete. Or you could essentially turn down all of it, just go to college, and then try and enter the draft again, okay? There are some different rules associated with the later port part of the NHL draft. But, Rob, essentially, that's what Jim Harbaugh is proposing and in my opinion, that should be across the board in any sport. No, I love it. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I mean, if, if you want to declare, I mean, the beauty about hockey and the beauty about baseball is that you reach a certain age and you can get drafted. If 100%. you don't get drafted, it doesn't change anything about who you are. 100%. I don't know, understand why it's so, it's so declaring, like, I have to declare for the I'm NFL done. draft. Like, right. I'm done. Like, it's, and that's where, and, and listen, I, I'm not for paying college athletes like you're getting paid two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to go to school like that's that's a pretty good salary by the way entry-level baseball salary is like 500 like let's let's be sure i could go back and forth on this but <laughs> but my, my point is is that when you look at draft eligible status and the 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 way that both ncaa college football and the nfl control that aspect of the players lives right well now it's like well, you're doing that for, for pure marketing purposes. Absolutely. So now 100%. it's like, so now it's like, okay, maybe then you should be playing the college football players because Absolutely. if you're controlling the way they play, where they play, and you know whether or not they're going to be able to even go back and play or, or go to school again, I mean, that's not that's not necessarily fair. And here's the thing: I understand the point that if you pay an agent or you get money for, let's say, an endorsement deal, then it makes you not college eligible. I get that. If you want to well, keep yeah, you that can't break rule, the money rule, hundred percent. Break the money NCAA rule. If you want to keep that rule, I'm down with that. But I do agree. If I enter the NFL draft, one, I should be able to enter it at, at any point in time. And it, and the point of Jim Harbaugh on the letter is, it's up to the family and the individual to decide when they're ready to take the leap to the professional level. So for me, as a 20 year old kid, I might say to myself, I need my junior year. It's going to be better for me in the draft. Right. And it's going to be better for me overall. Okay. But for you, the guy that who knows, maybe is blessed with more talent, maybe blessed with more size. After your freshman year, you might be like, I'm done with this college stuff. 
I believe I could be an NFL. Like, think about Trevor Lawrence. The only thing he did after his first year of playing in college essentially was hurt his draft stock. No. Listen, listen, one of the Your things, boy Jake Fromm? Listen, I know. Listen, <laughs> one of the things I love about watching the Frozen Four every year Tell is me. when you're going and you're watching, you know, Minnesota play whoever, you're watching Boston College play, it's like, oh, there's Chris Kreider, draft pick of the New York Rangers. Oh, there's so-and-so, draft pick of the uh, Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, there's so-and-so, draft pick of the uh, Colorado Avalanche. Like, these players have been drafted, they're protected by that draft status, and now they're able to develop, right? Like, nah, I mean, think about it. There's no, uh, there's no entry-level football league. Right, there's no secondary football league. There's no D. I mean, even basketball has a D league, right? The XFL, no secondary league in the NFL has ever lasted. You're either on the team or you're a practice player. There's no in between. Yeah. But imagine the guys that usually land in that mid range. Like, hey, I got drafted as a sophomore. I get to finish my high, my college career, and then I get to go try and make a squad. Like, well, and, and on top of that, so here's the second point that I really like from Harbaugh is that. If you do get drafted, there's something in there that states the amount of years with which you played football in college dictates the amount of years of education you get paid for once your football career is done. Because his point is, there's a three to four year shelf life window for the average NFL football player. The guys like the Aaron Rodgers and the Peyton Mannings and the guys that play 10, 12, 15 years, Tom Brady's. That is a, an, an exception to the rule when you think about the average shelf life of a National Football League player. That's just a fact. So in Jim Harbaugh's open letter to the college football community, he states that. And the point being is, okay, so I get drafted. Now, let's say I'm a first-round draft pick, but let's say I have a terrible injury. And three years in, all I have is the salary I got as a rookie, which is as a first-rounder is huge. If you're the fifth-rounder, you're cooked. So his point is now – at 25 years old, more perspective on life. They gave their professional football career a shot. Now they go back. Let's say that they were a sophomore. Okay, since they were a sophomore, that means they garner two years of additional paid for academics. If they only did one year of college, they only get one more year of additional paid they for academics. They can't academic. play, though, right? They can't play. Their eligibility is done. But it then gets them back in the classroom and now gives guys that, hey, listen, a first-round draft pick could leave college as a junior, not have a degree, get paid his first round draft pick money, but not make it past the first contract. And you're still sitting there without a college degree. Now you're going to have to spend some of that money to go back to college and get that degree. His point is let's protect these kids. Let's, but, and I know what your argument's going to be. I mean, I mean, here, 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 like that's fine. You want to go to protect the kids standpoint. That's fine. Right. But like, if they didn't have a full scholarship when they were at school, right? Why should I honor that full scholarship? Absolutely, I understand that. So, but I guess, and I guess my argument too, to the same point, I mean, like, sixty kids on a roster. You made the choice to leave. Why are we honoring the rest of your academics? Dude, well, that's the point. So I don't understand. Like, what's the goal? Like, what is his end game? Like, what's the goal? Is his goal to talk kids into staying in the school longer so they don't declare for the draft, so he can you use them to win championships longer? I guess essentially. I mean, that's that's really what it is because what if you don't get if you I mean, get drafted in the sixth like, round, you come back for your senior year. So, so what? So all this is about is is letting kids come get their degree again? No, it's it's about it's it's about the kids having the choice. I get okay, so it's but about a caveat the to it is also he would like so to what see. if I so what if I declare for the draft, I don't get drafted. You can go I back get to come back and I get to play. Yes. But it has to be the year after I don't get drafted. Yes. Why can't I get drafted and still play? That's what I want. You can get – well, it's, that's his point. You get to choose at any point in time. Okay, but why can't I get drafted and still be owned by that team and still play? That's his point. He wants that too. He wants – because I read it. I didn't really get that out of it. Well, no, it's not, I'm not necessarily saying that you have to be owned by that team. He just wants you to be able to choose. So let's say you get drafted in the fifth round by the Cincinnati Bengals, and you say, I have one more year of eligibility left. This is not a good option for me right now. Let me go back to college. You can make that choice. Let's say you go undrafted. You're not stuck being an undrafted free agent. You can go back to college if you have the years of eligibility left. How many times am I allowed to declare for the draft? Well, that's the question that has to be discussed because in baseball, like I laid it out, there's different ways. You could almost declare every year. So you in know, hockey, I don't know if it's different. So you, would, you don't have to declare anything. You just Your rights are owned for four years. Your rights but can you turn that down and go to college? 
no, no, you can keep it and go to college. Yeah, so I can get drafted by the New York Rangers. I can go to college for four years. Can't re-enter the draft though. Like, what if I know? No, first but draft pick? at the end of at the end of the term, which is like it's it's at the end of this is what Jimmy VC did. So Jimmy VC drafted by the Nashville Predators did not want to go to Nashville after four years of rookie camp, four years of college at Harvard, or however long it was. When that period ended, he became that's when the Rangers got him. He was a free agent. I think they ended up, they might have traded for his rights, but again, like if you don't want to play, like, but you're willing, you have options. You do. See, at the end of the day, I think the point of it is he wants the decision to be in the student athlete's hands. Yes, he's masking it that way, but ultimately he wants the players who make bad decisions to still come back and play for him. Well, yeah, but at the end of the day, it's 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 not it's no different than what he's you're making it seem so mean. It's not at all. He's you as a football player in that scenario would be pissed. You'd be like, dude, I'm undrafted. I don't want I want to go back for one more year. Why can't I go back? That's the angle you have to take. Don't take it as Jim Harbaugh trying to get his he gets his players for three years. This could get Adam lose players earlier. You have to make the draft more rounds. I don't believe so. Yes, you have to make the draft more rounds because think about it. I could draft ten people, and all ten could say, "Meh, I'm going to go back to the." Well, then you better be a better draft. I mean, in Major League Baseball. Yes, but there's 27 rounds in Major League Baseball, and you're drafting at 18 years old. They're not even defined. But there's also multiple organizations you have to fill spots for. There's only 90 NFL football roster spots. Okay, but that's that's and they come to camp at 120. Well, that's my point, dude. You get five rounds, five, seven rounds in the NFL. Fine, give them ten. You got to go to at least ten. I'll give them ten rounds. You have to, and if you're a top round draft pick, you have to make the choice. Not if you're not gonna not if not if you're gonna you're not going to extend the draft. Okay, so if you extend the draft, yes, the ki- it should be the baseball model. But the difference is, is in baseball, you get drafted, you're not going to Major League Baseball. I understand that. And only your top... But, that's but why, in the NFL, when you're drafted, you're expected to go play. Right, and that's why he believes that there is the choice. So if I believe as a sophomore, I'm ready to go play, I declare, and then... X team says, you know, we think you're ready to play too. I'm in as a sophomore. Now I have another year in the NFL maybe to learn, and and I'm good enough. But if I'm that same kid and I'm not good enough to do that, I can stay. But what's the difference if he goes and plays in the NFL? In three years, he gets hurt. Think about Chase Young. All he does is get his degree. He doesn't get to play football Chase again. Young could have been in the NFL. Yeah, but at the end of the day – they're not getting their degree if they leave their junior year regardless. Okay, but anyone can go back and get their degree. So what's the true point here? The true point here is that it should be like baseball and hockey where they have the choice. If you get drafted in baseball, okay, you can go back to college because you don't want to go but in the 17th round. Yeah, that's fine, but you don't have to declare for that. Yes, you do. You declare for the MLB draft. Okay, so you declare. Yes. You declare. You get drafted in seventeenth round. You say no. I'm not going to take it. I'm going back to college. That is the point. End of story. All right. That's that. How yeah. can't you support that? I I do support it. It's the point where you're like, okay, he gets to go to school. He gets to go to college. Then he gets hurt. You're making this big point about when he gets to get his degree if he goes to the NFL no. after sophomore year. No. Who no. cares? No, that was a minute point. What I said was he also put in here. That was just your intent. No. I did not say that. I said he goes to the NFL because he believes he can play as a sophomore. He's done with college football. Cool. I'm Chase Young. I'm a sophomore. I don't need my junior year, so I can declare because Jim Harbaugh, to his letter, thinks that that should be allowed because the kid believes he's ready. So now, as a sophomore, so he doesn't have to wait three years. Yeah. Okay. Who cares? <laughs> who cares? I, I, like, who cares? Like that's that's fair. That's fine. But football, yes. I mean, it's just. That's I think he's, he's splitting hair. Like he's, you know, like, I don't because right now the rule constitutes that once you declare it's over, you can't go back. Well, so does this. No, it does not. If I get drafted in this proposal, I can turn it down. Like baseball. Fair enough. Why but if you understand Because that? if he goes and plays, it's still over. No, it's, yes. Okay, but that's in every sport to the NCAA. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the ability to turn down being drafted or going undrafted and being able to return back to college. Eligibility still intact. 
as long as you have eligibility and meet the academic standard. I think you put a you have to put a limit on it that anyone drafted in rounds one through four can't do that. That's fair. You I think mean, that's very fair. You can't do that. You can't do it because you could literally. Or you expand the draft. Because you can be the Cleveland Browns and not one person would ever say yes to you. That's a fair point. <laughs> not one person would ever say yes to you. That's a fair You'd point. be like, no, you want to go to Cleveland? Yeah, no, I'm out. I'm out. I'll go back to college. Right. I'll, I'll play better football with Dabo Sweeney. Not one person. That's why you have to extend the draft. So I will remember to the best of my ability – to tweet this out so you people can read it. It's, it's an all, it is a good read. I respect oh, the heck out of Jim Harbaugh. And one side note, by the way, like right. that he hasn't beat Ohio State. Like I feel that. Like if I'm a Michigan fan, I want him to beat Ohio State. I feel oh, that. Guys. Yeah. But but the dude's still a very good college football coach. And when you talk about student athlete experience and what college is actually about, go look into some things that Jim Harbaugh has done in his career. Um, and recognize how great he is for college, specifically athletics. Take the winning out of it and think back about the student athlete, and then you'll really rethink who Jim Harbaugh is and the type of stuff that he cares about, which is the student athlete in their experience. Oh, good. When you're making oh, good. $6, $8 billion, no one cares about the student athlete. Right. Hey, Ruben, the screen is not there, so I don't know. It sounds like, do we have a caller right there? Yes, you do. Okay, caller. Hello. Yeah, we don't have the screen up, Rube, if you could reshare. Caller, give me your name, what you're calling about on the Rome show tonight. What's up, Rome? It's AJ. AJ! Calling about that, What's going uh, on? Boson put out either Reggie versus MJ for the last shot. You just called it the right time, AJ, because we were just about to get into the last dance. So, for those of you, before you get into your point, AJ, just so the Romo sapiens know what you're talking about, I put a poll up on Instagram. Last shot of the game, would you take Reggie Miller or Michael Jordan? AJ, the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, just last shot, just catch and shoot with an inbound play, I'm giving it to Reggie. But if you get, like, 30 seconds on the clock and you're pulling it up on the floor, you give it to Jordan to drive to the hole. I mean, like, if you give – Reggie's probably the best catch and shoot guy in NBA history, let's be real, besides Kyle Korver, but that's a different different story, but – Catching oh, three last shot, I'm giving to Reggie. I mean, I don't know why you would give it to Reggie Miller when Michael, what? when you have the option for Michael Jordan. <laughs> He's the best player of all time. You put the ball in his hands, right? And yeah, if the, the ball is not in his hands, time, the shooter, you're going to give the, the best is, shooter of all time. Like what? Yeah, yeah, he might be the again, best AJ? player of all time, but Reggie's the best shooter of all time. Just catch and shoot, Reggie's hitting the ball 10 out of 10. And if Michael's on the team, it's Michael passing Reggie the ball. That's my point. The ball's in Michael's yeah. hands. Yeah, but the, but, the, but the question was last shot. So to AJ's point, I'm still taking Reggie. I'm taking Michael every time. I'm always going to go to my best player. Well, I'll tell you what, AJ. You kind of made me a believer on on Reggie. Well, that's that's. I mean, yeah, I, but I would make this Reggie. argument back, AJ. I don't believe Kyle Korver is the second best spot shooter, catch and shoot guy of all time. I believe that would go to Ray Allen. Steve Kerr. Okay, yeah, I'll give it to Ray Allen. But everyone always overlooked Kyle Korver as just a spot up shooter. I mean, I think that's because he hasn't won anything. Yeah, he hasn't won anything, but that's that's why everyone overlooks him. But if you look at him, he's a great just spot up shooter. Just give him the ball and shooter. Saying not basketball player, but just straight up three point shooter. Kyle Korver all the time. I feel that. I feel that one hundred percent. What else you got for us tonight, AJ? Um, nothing much. Just enjoy, enjoy listening to the show, and uh, hope to talk to you soon. Appreciate you, dude. Hey, call in anytime. Seriously. Thanks, AJ. Yep, no problem. See ya. Catch and shoot. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't. Listen. Maybe. Maybe this is where my basketball gets to the ceiling. <laughs> because, like, all right. So then, don't even get into it. There's nothing that annoys me more than than NBA fans that tell me the best player shouldn't be the 
the, the players with the ball. Like, no, I, I don't but that's that. not – that wasn't the point. That is the point. No, I asked the question. If, if the shot was getting thrown to somebody <laughs> and they had to make it, would it be Michael or Reggie? And he – you can't be mad at him for his own opinion. Simply chose if getting a pass. You might choose Steve Kerr, apparently. <laughs> yeah, but I'd make sure Michael gives it to him. Yeah, 100%. And he said, if you listen to what he said, what if you're saying give the ball to somebody and have them drive, it's Michael. If you're telling me catch a pass and shoot, it's Reggie. Yeah, that's listen. That's you know what they, they understand the NBA skill set better than me. Episodes nine and ten of the Last Dance happened last night. It's over. I'm hands down saying it's one of my favorite documentaries of all time. Sports documentaries, no doubt. I love it. You it, had it some hard amazing. opinions. Give them to the people. I, I thought last night uh, was was magnificently done. I thought the Reggie Miller episode where they started in um, they started in Indiana, right? And they went they went two games up, and then they brought you you know their first loss, and then they showed Michael missing the last second shot, which he had 0.7 seconds, and he was mad. He was <laughs> no wait, he had 0.7 seconds to catch, land, double clutch, and shoot the ball. And he almost in, in it. Seven tenths of a second, yeah. Like they didn't hit the they didn't hit the button when he first touched the ball. Okay. Anyways, gotta love it. Gotta love the NBA for that. Um, <laughs> anyways, anyways, all I'm saying is is they I took didn't expect you to go there. <laughs> but they took that's what I was thinking. But they took the the interview post game. Oh, we gotta come back to Chicago and the reference to Utah and like brought that history yep. back into it the same way they'd be doing the whole episode. And you're like, wow, you really did need the context of his full career to really understand like how the end of that, how the end of his career with the Bulls like really came to fruition. And if you think about nineties basketball, essentially Michael Jordan, the Bulls just spent time crushing different dynasties hopes. Like yeah. the Pistons got the best of them to start off Jordan's career. Then Jordan crushed the Pistons. Yep. And he actually ended the Lakers in a way in the nineties. If you think about it as well with those magic teams, because he ended them as well. Yeah. Then Celtics kind of ended themselves. Right. Or the Pistons. 100%. The Pistons yeah. ended the Celtics. Yeah. And then, and then you come over here, and it's like, okay, we'll ruin the Pacers. We'll ruin the Knicks. Okay, we'll come over here. Well, let's ruin the Utah Jazz. Yeah, and, and, you know, <laughs> like, but in reality, in reality, he actually, you know, Michael gave the Pacers a chance. He gave the Pacers and the Knicks a chance because he was playing baseball. Yeah, ninety four and then ninety five, really. right? So he gives he gives the Knicks a chance. Well, and, and the Magic because the Magic in ninety four and ninety five, and they beat them in ninety five, and then in ninety six, they were back to back finals. The Magic, the East, the East was up for grabs. It was, and then Michael came back in ninety six and said, "Nah, sorry about it, but I'm Michael Jordan. I'm the greatest of all time." One thing I learned last night: Steve Kerr is a baller. And Rocky said this before, and I couldn't agree with it anymore. I wanted to say this. I said this before the show. You know, a lot of people talk about Steph Curry, and I do believe Steph Curry mm -hmm. would be – is the best shooter of all time. Spot up, three-point shooter, long range, best touch. I mean, off the charts, okay? You can't even deny it. Well, Steph Curry's coach, Steve Kerr, which you've learned a lot about in this documentary – Ended his career as the best percentage three-point shooter in NBA history. And oh, by the way, and I don't think a lot of people know this, because it just said he was traded at the end of the documentary. He was traded to the San Antonio Spurs. The next year, in 1999, won his fourth straight NBA title with the San Antonio Spurs. Found his way back to San Antonio in 2003 and ended his career winning his fifth title to San Antonio Spurs. And then, remember, one of the best shooters, right? In a time when the three-point shooting um, ability was starting to improve, Steve Kerr at the forefront of that. Well, why do you think Steph Curry became Steph Curry? And a lot of people make the point, you know, those teams are so good they, they could coach themselves. Well, now that I've watched this documentary and learned a lot about Steve Kerr, I'm like, you know what? You got to give these coaches credit because it seems to me like Phil Jackson was the only one that could have gotten those Bulls teams to do that. And it seems to me like Phil Jackson's the only one that could have gotten those Lakers teams to do that. So it also seems to me like Steve Kerr might be the only coach that could actually get those Golden State Warriors teams to do that. And hey, maybe, just maybe, and I'm going to give Steph Curry all the credit in the world because he came into the league as a great shooter. But maybe, just maybe, his mentor and his coach, Steve Kerr, might be the reason 
or a big part of the reason why Steph Curry has developed into the person he is because of the time that Steph has spent under Steve Kerr. Yeah, no, it's obvious that he knows how to teach that that team style of basketball that always allows you to have a three point shot open. Right, that's what that's how that's he, it. That's, I mean, that's I mean, how he. That's, 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 that's right. why his. I mean, that's why he, he said he's like, hey, I was the John Paxton. I came in as John. Paxton. I love that, by the way. I came in as John Paxton. I went under his wing. I learned how to be John Paxton, and I was always open to take that shot. You know, that's really what it was. And then he taught. He had a team. He built a team of three point shooters to do the same thing. Oh, yeah, except you could do it from five different people now. But that's better just him and one other. But that's and that's and that's and that. But that was his ability. Rather than only having one or two people that could do it, and have to play like you know down deep. He he was able to to keep it on the perimeter and only need one guy inside instead of three guys that had to go inside. Michael said that he believes that Chicago could have won a seven. I love that part. I love that part. That took that to me. That took the purity back into sports and took the business out of sports with that statement. He's like, if the Bulls offered all of us a one-year deal to go win seven, we all would have taken it. Agreed. And he even said, like, Scotty would have came back. He wouldn't have wanted to miss out would, that. You know, because that's, that is the athlete side of it. That's the side that always gets lost in sports today is the fact that the business has taken over the game. The business took over the fact that the, that the, the Bulls couldn't stay together. They could have. Right? They could have. Right? Like, by the way, have the Bulls won anything since then? No. They haven't won anything. So, like, great. And and by the way, that. and every fan, every fan today, every commentator, every analyst, oh, you got to rebuild through the draft. You got to do this and you got to do that. No, if you're on top, stay on top. Yeah. Why do you got to break it down? I agree. Why do you saying. have to break it down? And I know they showed the thing. You know, I Dennis, hate it. I Dennis hate Rodman's it. career, I saw it on ESPN today, like, was 35 games after that. And Pippen was – Never really fully pipping after that. Like, well, you don't know if in that scenario again they would have done what they did. And if you think about it, the Spurs won the next title. Well, would the Spurs, uh, would that Chicago Bulls? You could say that about every single championship team. Yeah, of course. Every player on every championship team, you could say the same. It depends on which which championship teams you're looking at. So we had a write in, and actually from our caller AJ. But what dynasty would you want to be? The next ten part documentary would it be the Spurs? You know with Tim Duncan, Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, that crew, or the Shaq and Kobe Lakers, or just the Kobe Lakers. In basketball? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going with the Lakers. I'd probably be interested, more interested in the Lakers than the Spurs, for sure. I, 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 I want to see the, the relationship. Well, I, just don't know who, I just don't know who the focal point of the Spurs would be if it's not Greg Popovich. It is. It's Greg Popovich. I think it's, it's Tim Duncan. It's Popovich, for sure. It's definitely it's Tim Duncan. Because now you're in Duncan's career more than you've ever been in. Yeah. You, yeah. I, I mean, I'd probably be more interested in a Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, 10-part documentary. I'd be more interested in a uh, in a Wayne. That'd be a good one. I'd be more interested in a Wayne Gretzky Edmonton Oiler documentary when they won four in a row. Um, I'd be a little bit even more interested um, in probably like a Murderer's Row documentary from the Yankees if you had everyone to come over back the together. Spurs. Over the Spurs, yeah. I, I just I don't know. This I don't. There's yeah. no there's no controversy surrounding the Spurs. People celebrate the Spurs for being fundamentally sound and awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I just think I think that's why the Lakers are better because you're like, ooh, Shaq and Kobe. Well, there's more controversy. Way more. No okay. Last thing on the last dance before we go to Rock's Reviews and wrap up the show. Our brother-in-law wrote this, and I thought it was really awesome. Could you imagine being the best athlete in the world and chain-smoking cigars? <laughs> that's true. Everyone's worried about it gambling. No one cares about the fact that he's crushing and cigars. by the way... His cigars are this long. <laughs> I mean, those are the longest cigars I've ever seen in my life. So long. Chain smoking cigars while being the best athlete of all time. of brothers he's the man he plays the main character and bobby a little up. parallel from former rock producer. that's right you've got damien uh i mean you've got paul giamatti who is just outstanding he's his, he's been another co-star and then you got maggie sip known um actually a lot of times from uh sons of anarchy 
Oh, uh, yes! That's Jack Teller's yes. girl in Sons of Anarchy. Is, is Jack Teller's old lady in wow. Sons of Anarchy. I know. I know, but we're in season five. Um, I'm three episodes deep or four episodes deep. This is billions. Point, it comes out, uh, it plays every Sunday night on Showtime. Um, and it's about a hedge fund manager who wants to take over the world from a monetary standpoint. And then you've got Paul Giamatti who plays his, um, his nemesis, who is the district attorney of New York. The beauty is that Maggie Sith is Bobby Axelrod's number one employee, like uh, wow. uh, human resources. She's like a pep talk person, right? For but she's married to Paul Giamatti. Oh, uh, who we have some inner office? Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. And like the way that they battle each other, and you want to and, and talk about talk about like uh, why she powerful be- watch. You should watch if you're into um, just awesomeness. Number one, but if you want a suspenseful that has nothing to do with death, type into Netflix awesomeness. Billion <laughs> comes up. No, nah, but if you want if you want suspense. Um, if you're interested in Wall Street, if you're interested in, in money, if you're interested in like the the fine line between law and order and Ooh. like everything else, okay, right? And you don't want to watch people die all the time, yeah, but like you want to see a power struggle, yeah, you're all in. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. It's got great. It, it's got great dialogue. It's Rock very review in-depth. out of ten. Out of 10, it's a 10 out of 10 for me. I wow. love it. And you want to know why? You're going to hear first, people. Not only do I love it, but I can watch it with my wife, and she loves it just oh, as much as me. So when you, can watch, when you can watch it with your spouse, it just makes it 10 times better. Well, I got to tell you guys, I've, I've never watched Brilliance. Get into it. And now I really want to watch. It makes you, it literally, it makes you want to work, and it makes you want to make money, and it makes you want to have awesome stuff, but it also makes you want to, like, be intellectually smarter. It's a huge chess game. Like, there's mm. so much going on. Wow. It's really good. Wow. And there's like, and, and Bobby Axelrod, Damian Lewis is number two. Wags, such a good character. Oh my God. You, such love, a, you love supporting roles. Supporting roles to me. Jeremy, me, Jeremy Piven and Entourage. Jeremy Piven and Entourage. Jeremy, Jeremy Axelrod, Axelrod or whatever yeah. his name is. I would, argue, I would argue that Vincent Chase is plays a uh, supporting role to Ari, uh, to Ari Gold. Oh, Gold. Sometimes. I would agree with that. But, uh, billions. All right. Billions. Get into it. Rock's Review, May 18th, 2020. Let's Billion. do it. Get into it. All right. Hey, this has been the Rome Show. You just heard the date. You know where we're located. We're on HamiltonRadio.net, Channel 2, Facebook.com slash Andrew.Roma. Now, look, we will be back next Monday, 7 p.m., same time, same location. We appreciate AJ, our caller, our producer, Ruben, Hamilton Radio for the support, the Romo Sapiens for tuning in everywhere that you tune in. Visit the social medias. At Wide World of Rome, at Coach Romo24. Visit the website, wideworldofrome.com. The apparel's up. I mean, the whole lot of it. You know the deal. And Romanella, Rocky Romanella. Until next Monday, we are out of here. Rocky Romanella is the founder and CEO of 360 Management Services, LLC, and author of the book, Tighten the Lug Nuts. With over 40 years of boots-on-the-ground leadership experience, Rocky creates excitement through his energy, passion, and knowledge in every podcast. During his 36 years at UPS, he led one of the largest rebranding initiatives in franchising history, the UPS Store, revolutionizing the $9 billion retail shipping and business services market. He also led the integration of more than 20 acquisitions that became UPS Supply Chain Solutions and led its improved financial performance, capabilities, and global footprint. Post-UPS, he served as CEO and Director for Unitech Global Services, a telecommunications company, and serves as an independent board member and advisor. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy the discussion. Do this look like work to you? Nah. Looking at the lights like it's all that is for me. Everyone in night is here. All that is for me. Hands in the air again. All that is for me. Bottles over here. All that is for me. Hey, good question. Good writing. Good calling. Love that. I like the new bottom of the show too, dude.